بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته thank you everybody for coming in today it is a very special day for us and it is a very special time and we are blessed to have been able to witness the first 10 days of the hijjah and these days are very important because these are the days that the pilgrimage takes place, the Hajj. And the Hajj, unlike the Umrah, the Umrah can be done any time of the year. But the Hajj can only be done at this specific moment, in these few days. And that's why you see that millions of Muslims from around the world, they go to Mecca from rich people to poor people from all races, from all around the world, they all go to Mecca during these days and they humble themselves, they all wear white clothes and they go and they perform the pilgrimage and it is a very blessed occasion. Now, the whole idea of Hajj, the whole actions, the whole pr procedure of Hajj is actually the legacy of one man. And it is a very important man in our religion and one who we should know the story of and whose story I will briefly go over today. And that man is Ibrahim alayhi salam. He is said to be an ummah all by himself. One man, he is known as a nation of himself. And if you think about it, Ibrahim alayhi salam is actually uh, the most popular and influential person on the earth right now and you can see this because the entire muslim population looks up to him we believe in ibrahim salam. we learn about his stories and we take lessons from them and if you look at the christians they also believe in ibrahim salam. Uh, they call him abraham and they take lessons from him and if you look at the jewish community they also believe in Ibrahim. That's why these religions are called Abrahamic faiths because all three of them descend from Ibrahim salam. And some would even say Hindus are also uh, related to Ibrahim, seeing as how their main god is called Brahma, sort of like Abraham. It's a valid theory, um, but if you loop those in as well, that's around two thirds of the world who are looking up and and uh, deriving uh, lessons from Ibrahim salam. And so this should give us an idea of how much of a legacy this man has left. And the Prophet Muhammad, our, our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, highlights the importance of Ibrahim salam when a man came up to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam and the man addressed him as the best of mankind. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, in his infinite humility, he said, no, that title belongs to Ibrahim alayhi salam. This man is praised by our Prophet, you know, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam, the man that every word he says, we try to jot it down. Anything he says happens. If he says Rome will be taken over, it gets taken over. If he says this is how the law should be, that's how the law is. Everything he says, we jot it down furiously, try to document everything he says and he is praising Ibrahim alayhi salam and in the Quran there are over 70 verses with Ibrahim alayhi salam there's even a surah dedicated to him called surah Ibrahim and Ibrahim is the only person in the Quran who Allah tells the Prophet to look up to as an example the person we take as an example was being told to look at Ibrahim alayhi salam for an example and so the reason why Ibrahim salam is such an important part of this world today is because he passed every single test Allah gave him with flying colors, with flying colors. And this is a recurring theme that you will see throughout his story is that he always places his trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and nobody else. And he proves time and again that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is his number one priority. Everybody else comes after. And so we can see this in his story. And his story starts from the moment he's born. 
Why does it start from the moment he's born? Because Ibrahim السلام, was born into a nation of idol worshippers. He was the drop of gold in a sea of darkness. There was nobody around him who uh, practiced monotheism, which is worshipping Allah. And even his own father would, would try to teach him to worship these idols. And it was very silly. And even this little boy, Ibrahim, could see that this didn't make sense because the people would carve their own idols and they would worship these idols. And the richer you were, the bigger idols you had. And sometimes if the poor people needed something, they would go to the rich people, borrow a bigger idol and pray to it and then give it back to them. And Ibrahim looked at this and he said, this is very foolish. You guys built these idols yourselves and you're worshiping them. And so Ibrahim السلام, simply as a teenager, no older than me, maybe even younger, he approaches his nation, his society and his own father and he respectfully starts talking with his father. And this is where we can take the first lesson from Ibrahim والسلام, is that even though his father was doing something that was wrong, Ibrahim والسلام, still showed him the utmost respect. And we can take away from this that you should always never raise your voice in front of your parents. You should always try to keep a level voice and you should respect them and never yell at them. Even if they're doing something that you do not agree with, even if they're making you do something, you should always address them respectfully. You know, I was listening to an interview by the fighter Khabib Nurmagomedov. Some of you guys might know him. And he was saying how um, when you're a teenager, uh, you think you're big and strong, you know, and you think you, you, you know everything and your parents know nothing. And you think you can do everything. You can carry the weight of the world on your shoulders. But then you forget when you were two years old and you couldn't even feed yourself. And your parents fed you and they bred you and they taught you everything you know. You forget about that stuff. And it takes something very humbling to bring you back down to earth, whether it be a sickness or a loss or some sort of injury. May Allah protect us and our parents. This shouldn't happen. We shouldn't need Allah to humble us in front of our parents. They raised us from when we were small and we should always res uh, respect them and address them in a very respectful manner, never raising our voices above theirs. And that's the first lesson that we can take away from Ibrahim salam. Now, Ibrahim, his time preaching was not very easy. He, he asked them, why are you worshipping these idols? And they simply replied, we're only doing what our fathers taught us. And he tried to make a point to them. He said, look at those stars. That could be your Lord. But then the stars went away. And he said, okay, the stars can't be your Lord because the stars went away. Then he looked at the moon and the sun. And he said, what about those? Those could be our Lord. But even the moon and the sun went away after a while and Ibrahim السلام, said, okay, this is not right. This can't be it because our Lord is somebody who never goes away. And he was trying and trying to convince his people, but eventually they got fed up with him. His people built a massive bonfire and they took Ibrahim to the bonfire and they said, if you do not stop preaching these ideas, we will throw you into the fire. Now, what does Ibrahim السلام, do? Does he say, you guys are right, I'm very sorry? Does he say, please don't throw me in? Or does he put his trust in Allah and stand up for what's right? He puts his trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he says, I will never stop preaching. And the people decide to throw him into the fire. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he loves how Ibrahim has put his trust in Allah. And Allah tells the fire to be cool and to be gentle. And the fire does not harm Ibrahim السلام, And he walks out of the fire and everyone is amazed, but they're also very infuriated. And this is the first instance where Ibrahim puts his trust in Allah and Allah rewards him for it. Now fast forward a little bit. 
Ibrahim السلام, is married to his wife Sarah and they're traveling through Egypt. And at this time, the leaders of Egypt were very corrupt people. And Sarah was a very beautiful woman, the wife of Prophet Ibrahim. And an evil tyrant took Sarah and he was trying to hurt her. And Ibrahim couldn't do anything. He simply made dua to Allah for Allah to protect his wife. And even though Sarah was all the way in with the king in his room, in his palace, and Ibrahim was all the way out in some tent far away, all he could do was make dua and put his trust in Allah. Again, he's putting his trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah rewarded him. The king became paralyzed and he couldn't even lift a finger to harm uh, our beloved Sarah. And this is just another instance where Ibrahim places his trust in Allah and Allah delivers for him. Now we can fast forward a little bit more. Again, I'm trying to keep it brief and keep it moving. Uh, Ibrahim has a second wife named Hajjah. And now there's three of them, Ibrahim, Salah, and Hajjah. Only three people who are worshiping Allah. Keep in mind, during Ibrahim's time, he didn't convert that many people. That was another one of his tests that he had to go through, that no matter how much he tried, he just people just wouldn't listen to him. And so right now, there were only three people who believed in Allah, and that was him and his two wives. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when Ibrahim was 80 years old, 8-0, 80 years old, Allah passed down some laws to Ibrahim and some commandments. And some of these were very painful and they required you know, some bravery. But again, Ibrahim, he did what Allah asked him to do. And in the end, it worked out for him. Eventually, the news is delivered that Ibrahim السلام, is having a child. And he's very happy because he's been making dua for a long time for Allah to give him a child. But after the child is born, Ibrahim is commanded to leave Hajar and his child in the desert, away from any civilization. Now put yourself in Ibrahim salam's shoes. You've been waiting for 80 plus years to have a child. Finally, Allah gives you a child and he tells you to leave him in the middle of the desert. What do you think Ibrahim salam did? What do you think he did when, when Allah commanded him to do something? He listened and he obeyed. He took his wife and his son. They went out into the desert. And as Ibrahim was walking away, he could hear Ismail. He could hear Ismail crying and he could hear his wife begging. Why are you leaving us here? How many of the fathers who are watching this, how many of you think you can leave your crying baby and your wife? in the middle of nowhere, as they cry and beg for you, and as you have to walk away from them. And you're 80 plus years old, you finally got a son, and you have to leave them in the desert. I don't think many of us would have the strength to do that. But Ibrahim السلام, is not any of us. He is transcendent among us. And he places his trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as we know the story, Hajar runs from Safa to Marwa looking for a caravan. And eventually Ismail, Jibril comes down and makes the well, the Zamzam well. That the Zamzam well was a miracle at the time, and it's still a miracle today. Millions and millions of gallons come out all the way from Ibrahim's time till now. It's like there's a secret ocean under Mecca or something. You know, it's still, if you go to Mecca, you have all these uh, coolers where they have Zamzam. And my dad himself brings back a few gallons. Imagine all the pilgrims that go and take Zamzam for their homes. This is truly a miracle of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that this well has not gone dry. Now, something that I just said was very important. And that was Hajar running from Safa to Marwa. And this actually became part of our pil pilgrimage. It's part of the hajj, of the ritual. It's part of the procedure. And like I said in the beginning, 
Ibrahim salam's life was the reason why Hajj is the way that it is. Because the actions of him and his wives and his children are what made Hajj what it is. And this was the first thing, running from Safa to Marwa, that we do it today. We take it from back then and we do it today. And so it's a very important thing to note that the running between Safa and Marwa, it comes from um, Hajar. So eventually, um, Ibrahim salam, he passes the test, he gets his son back. And what does Allah tell him to do once he gets his son back? Does Allah tell him, oh, you can go, you know, you can relax in your house. I've tested you enough. I mean, Ibrahim is, he's pushing 90 now. He's pushing 90 years old. He finally got his son back after abandoning him in the desert. And what does Allah tell him to do? He tells him to sacrifice his son. To kill his only progeny. He's 95 years old. He's about to pass away. He has one son. Okay? And this son was going to carry on the family legacy. And Allah told him to sacrifice Ismail. And Ismail was only 13 years old at the time. But he even understood that it was a commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he said, if Allah wishes for you to do this, then please do it. He even accepted it. And so, Ibrahim took his son, he took the blade with him, and he laid his son down. And as he was about to, um, or as he was thinking, as he was about to sacrifice his son, Shaitan appears before him. And Shaitan tells him, uh, hold on, man, uh, what are you doing? What, this is your only son. Why are you sacrificing him? And from our standpoint, we would listen to Shaitan. We'd be like, what are we doing? This is, our, this is my only son. Why would I sacrifice him? But Ibrahim, السلام, his iman was so true that he threw seven stones at the Shaitan and he moved locations. He took Ismail and they went somewhere else. Once again, he laid Ismail down. He was about to cut his throat. And shaitan appears before him again. And again, shaitan tries to convince him out of it. He said, what are you doing? This is your only son. Why would you sacrifice your only son? You're 95. But again, Ibrahim, time and again, he's being tempted by these thoughts. But he proceeds to throw stones at shaitan. And he moves again to another location. And it happens again. Now, eventually... Allah doesn't actually want a sacrifice. He's only testing. And he saw in Ibrahim's heart that he was about to do it. So he stopped him. But the main takeaway of today is what Ibrahim did. The throwing of the stones. When he threw the stones at shaitan, that was another moment that was engraved in history and something that has passed down today. And the hujaj, the millions of people that go to hajj, um, during this time of year, they also stone the shaitan and they're upholding Ibrahim salam's legacy. And so again, this is another thing in Ibrahim's life that has, that has passed down till today. And people are still doing it today. Like a few days ago, people did it. And this was who knows how long ago. Now, finally, I want to end off the life of Ibrahim salam. Um, and it's important to know that when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he did Isra al-Miraj, for those who don't know, that that was a, a journey he had, a spiritual journey, where he visited a number of different places. Um, he comes back to the companions, the Sahaba, and he tells them that he saw Ibrahim alayhi salam. And he saw Ibrahim alayhi salam leaning on the Bayt al-Ma'mur. And the Bayt al-Ma'mur, you can think of it as sort of a, it's like a Kaaba, but for angels. You know, we have the Kaaba, we, you know, do tawaf around it, we worship it. The Bayt al-Ma'mur is kind of like the Kaaba for the angels. And they worship it and they do tawaf around it. And it's only fitting that Ibrahim a.s. would be leaning on it. And because he was the one who built the Kaaba, Ibrahim and Ismail, they built the Kaaba, the one that we worship today. 
That's yet another thing. It's yet another action from Ibrahim that is passed down. And it's something very monumental because he built the Qibla. Him and Ismail السلام, literally built the Qibla that we pray to, that Hujaj go to, to do tawaf around. And Muhammad وسلم, he went up to Ibrahim السلام, and Ibrahim السلام, told Muhammad, please give salam to your ummah from me. Let me say that again. He told Muhammad, please give salam to your ummah from me. Meaning, Ibrahim السلام, has said salam to you and me. Wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The most influential man on the face of the planet has said salam to you and me. This really, subhanAllah, it should touch our hearts that we are being addressed by someone like this. And through our very own Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, kind of wrapping up this entire Ibrahim storyline, we learn to put our trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a recurring theme in his life that he continued to do. And we can see that by the end of his life, he was a very close friend of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we can see how his legacy has been passed down through the Abrahamic faiths into us Muslims and Christians and Jews today and how we honor his legacy. You know, it's very funny. I was thinking the other day, you know how prophets are supposed to be, not supposed to be, they are, you know, they're, they're on another level, right? Like no matter how pious I get, I will never reach the level of a prophet. And they were very close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So why is it, can someone please tell me, why is it that the prophets, the ones that are the closest to Allah, have to endure the hardest tests? Why do they have to sacrifice their own sons? Why do they have illnesses that, that, are, that are prevalent throughout their lives? Why do they get thrown in jail? Why do they get dumped in wells? Why do they endure a boycott for three years? Why do they have to fight in wars? Why do they have to build a boat in the middle of a desert when everyone laughs at them? Why is it that the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala endure the hardest tests? It's because... Allah tests the people that He loves. And those prophets are close to Allah because they passed those tests. Now you and I, we will never have to do something like Ibrahim a.s. We will never have to sacrifice our own son, inshallah. So we don't have to worry about something drastic. But we can see from Ibrahim a.s. that if you put your trust in Allah and you follow His commandments, it will take you places. We learn... Patience from Ibrahim alayhi salam. We learn perseverance from Ibrahim alayhi salam. We learn commitment and trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We learn to preach the truth even if everyone around us is telling us to stop and threatening us. We know that we must preach the truth. He teaches us bravery. He, preach, he teaches us sincerity and patience for persecution. Now, one event that I want to mention is that some angels came down and they told Ibrahim that we're going to go punish the people of Solomon and Gomorrah. Um, these were like non-Muslim or, uh, you know, some idol worshippers. And Ibrahim, alayhi salam, <coughs> he begged the angels to spare them because he said, inshallah, maybe they will one day come for the truth. Look at how humble and, and tender-hearted this man was. That he begged for the lives of his enemies. When he knows Allah is going to destroy them, he begged the angels, please, please spare these people. But the angels said, when Allah's decree comes down, there's no going back. But we can see that Ibrahim salam was a very tender-hearted person. And he was a very kind person. Now, Let's step away from the Ibrahim story and look at today. We just learned the legacy of Ibrahim alayhi salam, how his actions and the actions of his wife and the actions of his son influence everything that we do and everything the pilgrims have done in the past few days. And alhamdulillah, 
I want to say Alhamdulillah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed us to witness another um, month of Dhul Hijjah. Now, Allah has not created all the days equally. You know, there's 12 months in the year and there's four seasons and the days, they change throughout the year. You know, during the summer, the days are longer. During the winter, the days are shorter. During the summer, the weather tends to be warmer. And during the winter, the weather tends to be colder. In autumn, the leaves fall away from the trees. And in spring, they come up again and the flowers are in bloom. So we can see that Allah has not created every single day the same. If you take two days from the year at random, they're most likely going to be different in some way or another. Now, just like Allah has created these days differently, He has also created the days differently in terms of their spiritual value. And we, we learned that during the week, the most uh, spiritual and blessed day of the week is Friday. That is the most spiritual and blessed day of the week. And we learned that in the whole year, what is the most spiritual month in the whole year, the most sacred month? It is the month of Ramadan. Now, in Ramadan, the last 10 nights are considered the most um, sacred 10 nights of the whole year. So hold on a second. If there is uh, the most sacred 10 nights of the whole year, then what about the sacred 10 days throughout the whole year? Are they in Ramadan? Are they scattered throughout the year? What are the most sacred 10 days of the year? And the answer is right now. The first 10 days of Dhul Hijjah are even more sacred than the, day, than the days of Ramadan. The days that we are experiencing right now are more sacred than the days of Ramadan. And usually the first 10 days of Dhul Hijjah, they kind of catch us off guard. Because we don't really see them coming. They just kind of come out of nowhere. Whereas for Ramadan, you know, you've got Ramadan workshops, you've got webinars, you use uh, the month of Shaban to prepare. And obviously the masjids also, they start having more programs, they have fundraisers. So we mentally prepare for Ramadan. But when it comes to the Hijjah, these days are more sacred, but we're not preparing for them. And now they're almost gone. So... This is just something to think about that why are we preparing for Ramadan and not for the, for the days of Dhul Hijjah? And it is something that we need to keep in mind next year, inshallah, if we happen to witness them again. Now, to be truthful, brothers and sisters, the reason why we value Ramadan more is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it mandatory on us to fast because that changes everything. When Allah tells us you have to fast during this month, it changes everything because we are being told to do something. Now, in the Hijjah, that's not the case. We don't, it's not mandatory to fast. But if you ask me, it seems pretty sad that Allah has to force us to do something in order for us to get the value out of it. Why should Allah have to make something fard? Why can't we? take the initiative and take the opportunity that is being presented to us. And the, the Prophet Sallallahu he said that there are no days in the year that are more beloved to Allah that a person does good than the first 10 days of the Hijjah. And so these days are very important. And out of these 10 days, there is one day that stands out. And that is the day of Arafat. Now, when is the day of Arafat? For those who are watching this live right now, or today um, on Sunday, July 18th, it's actually right now. Yes, let me say that again. No, it's not tomorrow. No, it's right now. The day of Arafat is right now. There's no waiting. There's no preparing. We didn't know, but now it's here. Now, what do we do? Because it's after Maghrib in the Islamic tradition, we are now on to the next day, on to the, the day of Arafat. Now, unfortunately, unfortunately, I wish I could have given this talk maybe last week, 
I think it would have been more beneficial for us because we would have been able to spend the 10 days wisely. But that's no matter because we still have one day and it's the most important day. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with the opportunity to reevaluate and reconfigure ourselves to take advantage of this day. The most important day of the year. Now, what can we do during these 10 days? This is for inshallah next year. What can we do during these 10 days to fully take advantage of them? The first thing that we can do is do Umrah. If you do two Umrahs during these 10 days, your sins are wiped away like a furnace, which is burning ore. You know how when you're burning ore, for those who play Minecraft, you know how you mine iron ore and you put it in the furnace and you burn it and then you get iron, right? Because all the impurities and all the rocks and all the other stuff in it gets burned away, leaving only the iron. So think of the iron as your good deeds and all the other impurities as the bad deeds. And when you put an iron ore in the furnace, it takes away all the impurities, leaving you with a nice iron ingot of good deeds. Now, of course, for those of us who are sitting at home doing an umrah, much less two umrahs, is kind of out of the question. So what can we do instead uh, from here at home? And specifically tomorrow, we should all make the intention right now to fast. So fasting during these 10 days is recommended. But during Arafat, you really should fast on the day of Arafat. Because um, the Prophet ﷺ, he fasted during the day of Arafat. And one of his wives narrates that among the things that the Prophet ﷺ did, he never missed a day of Arafat without fasting. And if you fast on the day of Arafat, it'll wipe your sins from the previous year and the following year. So if you would like your sins wiped from the previous year and the next year that's coming up, just fast tomorrow. It's not that difficult. You know, for the children who are uh, on summer break, it'll be easier for us because we can sleep in. And even though it is summer, the days are longer, but we're on summer break. And for those who have jobs or other commitments, please try to take a day off from your job because this is a day that you do not want to miss. It is a day we should take advantage of. And it is a day that we cannot let go by without taking full advantage of it. And so I urge everybody to fast tomorrow, inshallah. Make the intention now. Make the intention in your heart. Set your alarms. Get your phones out. Set your alarms. And inshallah, we'll wake up for suhoor where we will all make suhoor and we will all fast on the day of Arafat. Now, another thing that we can do during these days, starting right now, you don't have to wait till tomorrow, starting right now is doing extra dhikr. You know, people only do dhikr when it's time for Eid. You know how you say the takbirat and you're, you know, you're yelling takbirat in the car and in the masjid. You don't have to wait for that, actually. You can start doing it right now. And it is said that the Sahaba, they would, they, they were so full of emotion that they would yell these things as they're going through the marketplace. And they would just yell it out because of these blessed days. Now, please, I'm not telling you guys to run through the airport yelling Allahu Akbar. Don't do that and don't bring it back to me. Obviously, you have to have some control. But, but the whole idea is that we should not stop doing dhikr. And we should say it out loud in our homes. If you drink a nice glass of water, say Alhamdulillah, say Bismillah before you eat. Do these things during these days because you don't want to let them pass. And three days after Eid, after every prayer, they would do takbirat, inshallah. We will do this. For those who go to the masjid, you might notice it happening. Now, the fourth thing is repentance. Asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. And there is no day that Allah frees more people from the fire than Arafat. Tomorrow and technically today, starting right now, there's not a single day in the year where Allah frees more people from the fire. Don't you want to be part of that crowd? Don't you want to be part of the crowd where Allah takes you from Jahannam and puts you in Jannah? Who doesn't want to be part of that crowd? You can do it. Just ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. Now, 
tomorrow, inshallah, and even tonight before you go to sleep, just do some extra voluntary acts. You know, you can pray some sunnah after Isha, pray sunnah before Fajr, you know, read some Quran. You know, people rarely open their Qurans. It's kind of more like a Ramadan thing. It doesn't have to be a Ramadan thing. It can be a now thing, and you can make it a now thing. Give some charity tomorrow, you know, um, take the day off, dedicate it to worship. These 15 hours will change lives. They change lives and they change afterlives. These 15 hours that are coming up, they change lives and they change afterlives. Don't be one of the losers. Do not be one of the losers. Take advantage of this day because you don't know if you can witness it again. And finally, um, it is the sacrificing of the animal. And I know so for some of the youth watching it, it's not an option, but please try to encourage your parents to do, to do this. I gave a khutbah on this last year, um, but just to keep it short, this is a tradition that was a sunnah. And most people today, they just send some money and they say, okay, that's it. I did my qurbani. I'm sorry, brother, that's not how it works. It is a sunnah to go and sacrifice a goat or a sheep or a camel for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And some scholars say it's obligatory for those who can afford. Others say it is optional, whatever works. But I would highly encourage you to do it. Usually one animal is enough for a family. But if you do a larger animal like a camel or a cow, that feeds like seven families. Um, but even if you have one one small animal, you can still give out the meat to your neighbors and your friends and spread the barakah. And it is said that the animal that you sacrifice, the amount of hairs on the animal are the amount of sins that you're forgiven. So imagine all the hairs on the entire animal, all those sins just get wiped away from your left side. And the sacrifice usually happens after Eid on the 10th, 11th, 12th or 13th of the Hijjah. Speaking of Eid, who's excited for Eid? You know, it's one of the only two day two Eids that we have throughout the whole year. You know, who who doesn't get who doesn't get excited for it? But the thing is, people take the day off for Eid. They prepare for Eid. But people don't take the day off for the day before Eid, the day of Arafat. Why is that? Why why do we take Eid for granted? Eid is not something you wait around for. You know, in Ramadan, you've just done a whole month of worship. So the Eid at the end is kind of like a reward. You're celebrating. What are we celebrating two days from now? What did we do? Do we deserve Eid? I know it's a silly question, but just ask yourself this. Do we deserve Eid? Did we do something? Did we gain something from these blessed days? You know, for the Hajjaj that are obviously, they did Hajj. For them, it makes sense. But we were just sitting at home. Why do we deserve Eid? Let's make ourselves deserve Eid. Tomorrow, you make the day count. And the day after tomorrow, you can emerge proud. Obviously, a humility type of pride that, alhamdulillah, I took advantage of the day of Arafat. It is obligatory on every Muslim, male or female. Go to your masjids. I know MCA is having some uh, different prayers. SBI is having some. Find your local masjid. And go for the Eid prayer. And alhamdulillah, that concludes my talk. Just to recap slowly, uh, the first thing, the first thing that you can do is that to do Umrah. Now, of course, this may not be an option. So moving on, you can fast. And we are fasting tomorrow. Say it with me. We are fasting tomorrow. Make the intention in your heart and set your alarms, whatever you need to do. We are going to fast tomorrow because we want to be part of the crowd that is plucked out of Jahannam and put in Jannah. Make sure to do extra, extra dhikr. Say it out loud. Say it wherever you go. But please don't scare people. Okay, that's not part of the whole the whole uh, Eid and Arafat spirit. Repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, there's no day that Allah forgives more people than today. Not tomorrow, today. Right now. Offer up some extra prayer, give some charity, read some Quran, whatever you want to do. Try to take the day off. Stay away from social media. Stay away from video games. When you're fasting until Maghrib, please stay away from social media. Try to take the day off from your work. For those who are on summer break, 
say Alhamdulillah because we have a huge opportunity in front of us. And so stay away from any distractions. Try to get dedicate tomorrow for the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and seek repentance from Him. If it's not too late, please try to sacrifice an animal. It is a sunnah and I encourage everyone to do it. And, event, and finally, pray the Eid prayer. If you see me, come say salam to me. I look forward to meeting you all. Please join me in a short dua. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma qfil al-mu'minin wa al-mu'minat wa al-muslimin wa al-muslimat wa al-ahiyai minhum wa al-amwat. Allahumma rabbi rhamhuma kema rabbi yani saghira. Rabbi ja'alni muqim al-salati wa min durriyati rabbana wa dukhabbal dua. Allahumma ajinna min al-nar. Allahumma ajinna min al-nar. Allahumma ajinna min al-nar. Rabbi zidni ilma. Rabbi zidni ilma. Rabbi zidni ilma. Allahumma innaka afun tuhibbu al-afa fafu anna. Allahumma innaka afun tuhibbu al-afa fafu anna. Allahumma innaka afun tuhibbu al-afa fafu anna. Rabbana gfil li wa li waladai wa li al-mu'minin yawm yaqum al-hisab. Rabbana atina fi al-dunya hasana wa fi al-akhirati hasana wa qina a'zaab al-nar. Rabbana zalamna anfusana wa illam taghfil lana wa tarhamna lanakurna min al-khasirin. ربنا وآتنا ما وعدتنا على رسلك ولا تخزنا يوم القيامة إنك لا تخلف الميعاد ربنا إنك جامع الناس اليوم لا غيب فيه إن الله لا يخلف الميعاد ربنا لا تواخذنا إن نسينا واخطأنا ربنا ولا تحمل علينا إسرا كما حملته على الذين من قبلنا ربنا ولا تحملنا ما لا طاقة لنا به وعف عنا واغفر لنا وارحمنا أنت مولانا فانصرنا على القوم الكافرين Oh Allah, please help us take advantage of the day of Arafat Oh Allah, please um, forgive our sins Make us among the winners of today make, make us among the people who are taken from the hellfire and put in heaven Oh Allah, please forgive our sins Oh Allah, please make our fast tomorrow and today easy for us Please help us take advantage of these days Please help us take advantage of these days in the future, inshallah. Please help us witness another month of Dhul-Hijjah next year. And please help us prepare for it and take advantage of it and reap the rewards, inshallah. Subhanahu rabbi ya rabbil a'izati arma yasifoon. Wa salamun ala al-mursaleen. Wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.